And thank um, you, everybody. I'm sure it was quite an effort to move from, from, from one room to another to join me today, so I appreciate it. Um, we don't have too much time together, so I'm not going to offer too much of a preamble. Um, as I was organizing this exhibition, I gave myself a very straightforward directive, select artworks from the collection that had a story to tell. And I purposely chose artworks that had a specific experience to relate or that shed light on an aspect of American life and history. What resulted as I refined the checklist was I think a rather poignant reflection on the diversity of American life and experience, a reminder that being American is not the same for everyone and that those disparate realities are not necessarily differences in time or place, but also in circumstance and opportunity. It also highlighted for me the power of art to transcend to respect the dignity of every American and the validity of their lives led. Um, as I went through this process, I found myself very moved by the stories and really, really feeling the importance of uh, and power of stories. And sometimes they offer dual perspectives, especially in portraits where you have both the artist and the sitter, but sometimes also the theme offering dual perspectives in a single work of art. Um, no matter though, the frame of reference is always personal, but the aggregate drives a grander narrative of a nation whose multitudes, even whose divisions contribute to the consensus. Recently, I have been struck listening to the news by the many references to America in the present tense as the great experiment in democracy. At 250 years, we are still experimental. The artworks in this exhibition have much to offer if one spends time with them. And I do hope that those of you who are able to get to the museum will go and appreciate these works in person. They speak to the development of national identity, but more importantly, they speak to its mercurial, ever-changing, and fragile nature. The exhibition's divided into four main sections, founders, travelers, philosophers, and seekers. I'm going to try to really give you a virtual tour by walking you through the different galleries um, and passing artworks that I won't necessarily speak about, but that you certainly can feel free to ask me about later. In 1776, the Hessian-born Johann Christian Strange was one of around 1,200 soldiers who were most probably conscripted, though some of them enlisted, in what came to be the German Grenadier Regiment under the command of um, Johann Rall. And they were actually hired by the British um, to fight on the British side during the American Revolution. So Strange came to the American colonies to fight against the American patriots. And he was one of the, the um, 1,200 or so soldiers, or 1,000 or so soldiers, who were captured at the Battle of Trenton um, right, you know, on, on right after Christmas, um, that famous battle when George Washington crossed the Delaware. And these soldiers were marched um, from Trenton to Philadelphia, and then interned um, in Lancaster in camps. Strange gained his freedom at the end of the war um, in 1777, and at the end of the war, the German troops were given a choice to either return um, or to stay as Americans. So he's one of the um, immigrants who came to America as a soldier and stayed as a citizen. And he joined the many, many other German immigrants who had come much earlier at the behest of William Penn. Um, he became a school teacher and a scrivener, um, which means that he had a beautiful hand and could write and could do decorative pieces such as this Liebesbrief or a love letter. He taught in Lutheran and Reformed communities in Lancaster and in, um, and in East Petersburg, Pennsylvania. 
And um, this is just a beautiful example of his work after that very checkered career. Another um, person who came to America as a soldier, but remained as a citizen, but with a more um, nefarious background is Richard Brunton. This is a tiny wood print in the museum's collection. The word love appears backwards because when it's printed on paper, um, it would read the correct way. And these lovebirds seem to be a recurring um, motif in Brunton's work. He was a die sinker. Um, and he came as a British soldier um, with the 38th Regiment of Foot. He participated in the battles of Bunker Hill, um, campaigns in New York. He also fought at the Battle of, uh, of Trenton, so his path might even have crossed with Christian Strenge um, and in Philadelphia. But by 1779, he deserted at Verplanck's Point in New York, and he's made his way back to the Boston area where he tried to earn an honest living at first, but then turned to illicit activities to um, survive. The British had actually instituted a campaign of counterfeit currency to undermine the Continental Congress's ability to fund the war effort. So people like Brunton with the ability to um, create counterfeit coinage were um, in demand during the war. And after the war, some of the states actually turned a blind eye to counterfeit currency to um, allow their own um, economies to remain stable. But Brunton was um, found to be counterfeiting and he was arrested and he was sent to the notorious Newgate Prison in Connecticut. And this is one of his um, renderings of Newgate Prison. He was released after two years and he made his way back to Massachusetts where he continued um, to create counterfeit currency. And in 1807, he was arrested once again um, with the tools of his trade and actual coinage in his possession and sent to Charlestown Prison, um, more formally known as Massachusetts State Prison at Charlestown. Um, this watercolor portrayal of the prison is in the exhibition. And that was just two years after the prison was built. He was given a life sentence, and the prison records describe him as a man age 58, six feet one in height, with fair skin, gray eyes, and dark hair. During both incarcerations, Brunton continued to create works of art. He made family registers. He um, made this um, beautiful silver pendant. He even portrayed the jail keepers and their families. This is a portrait of Anna Humphreys, whose um, husband was one of the jail keepers that Brunton interacted with. And the broadside at the top is um, part of a, a, of a full broad broadside that is giving um, stagecoach um, uh, um, schedules. And it's the earliest, if not one of the earliest depictions of transportation in the new American country. Um, in 1811, Brunton was granted a pardon on grounds of ill health, but he fooled everybody and he lived another 21 years. Now, Brunton and Strange may have come to the colonies um, as foreigners fighting against American liberty, but they became citizens, um, Strange certainly with all of the powers and freedoms afforded the citizens of the newly formed United States. A young woman like Lucina Hudson, who created this needlework at the Abbey Wright School in South Hadley, Massachusetts, although she was native born, would not have been granted those freedoms because she was female. Her father fought in the war. Um, the family was from Oxford, Massachusetts, and several Oxford families actually sent their daughters to the Abbey Wright School in South Hadley, where they stitched um, beautiful needleworks celebrating American liberty in the allegorical figure of a woman 
um, holding the flag and a freedom cap and a cornucopia of plenty, um, yet they were not allowed to engage in the full freedoms afforded um, their fathers who had fought in the war and other male citizens. Um, so it's always an irony that women are often used historically to represent freedoms that they themselves did not enjoy. Um, the Abbey Wright School was one of a multitude of schools that sprang up, especially along the Eastern Seaboard, to educate young women um, in part for their own edification, but primarily to um, give them the um, advantages that they would need to raise moral and educated sons who would go on to lead the country. Um, one of the mottos of Abby Wright's educational goals was to lead young women, quote, in the paths of rectitude and virtue that they may establish an unblemished reputation and become ornaments to society. And this effort to educate young women to raise um, the future leaders of America um, is often called Republican motherhood. Now, certainly if Lucina Hudson didn't enjoy the full liberties of um, the newly formed American nation, the enslaved populations who had been here for hundreds of years um, enjoyed none. This is one of a number of jugs and vessels, storage vessels that were created by a member of the enslaved workforce who signed many of his pieces with his name, Dave, which was itself just the act of signing this vessel of incredible bravery um, and self-actualization. And if Dave had not incised these um, storage vessels, around 100 of them have either his signature or snippets of poetry, we would know nothing about him and uh, about the legacy that he has left. Um, slaves, of course, were not only not encouraged to learn to read and write, it was against the law with very, very harsh um, retributions if, um, if it was discovered, um, but Dave, who later took the name Drake in the census of 1870, um, naming himself Dave Drake, the name of the first household to which he belonged, um, was, if, if not encouraged, certainly not punished by some of the households to which he belonged, especially the Lewis Miles household. And you can see um, LM at the top of this, of this vessel, of this jar, LM, October 26, 1853, Dave. Dave was, Dave Drake was born around 1800 and um, he was a member of the household of Harvey Drake and Drake and his uncle Abner Landrum had one of the earliest potteries in the Edgefield district of South Carolina. In fact, it became such a large pottery producing area that they called it Pottersville. And Landrum um, is often credited with innovating the use of an alkaline glaze, which was not poisonous the way that lead glazes were. South Carolina had previously been dependent upon importing storage um, vessels from the northern states and from other areas of the south. Um, but they innovated this technique of creating watertight stoneware vessels um, that enabled them to supply quite a wide range with vessels from their factories. Dave became a master potter, one of around 76 known enslaved African Americans working in the Edgefield potteries. But he was only one of two known potters who could produce vessels up to a 40 gallon capacity. Remarkably, um, Dave had a railroad accident around 1835 or so, and he lost one of his legs. And how could he continue to turn pottery um, with the loss of a leg? Well, he teamed up with another potter named Henry who had lost the use of his arms. So with Henry, using his legs to turn the wheel and Dave using his hands, he was able to continue producing um, his, his beautiful 
and um, and and um, very very important pottery. This is a piece in the Greenville County Museum of Art um, with an example of the kinds of um, thoughts and poems and phrases and other other um, texts that Dave wanted to incorporate into his pottery. And I've included a page of just all the different poems um, and snippets that Dave incorporated on his on his pottery. It's around 27 or 30 of um, the hundred known pieces include um, such phrases. Many more include just his name and a date. Um, from around 1840 to 1843, Three, Dave was in the household of Lewis Miles and very productive in terms of his pots and in terms of the inscriptions that he put into his pottery. But for a number of years after that, while he was in the household, uh, in a different household, the pots are mute, which probably speaks to the tenor of the household in which he was enslaved at the time, um, where treatment was not kind. It wasn't until he re-entered the household of Lewis Miles that his pots began to sing once again. This is a portrait of Eliza Gordon, later to become Eliza Gordon Brooks. Eliza Gordon was painted when she was around 20 years old. Um, and you can see she looks very fresh faced and, and very open in this portrait. We don't know why she had her portrait painted at this time, but it may have been about the time that she entered the workforce of the Phoenix textile mill. She was from Henniker. Um, the Phoenix Mill was around 27 or 30 miles away, but she joined a growing number, really thousands of young women from New England farming communities who were um, gaining some independence on the one hand by leaving their families and going to work in the mills where they could earn a living of their own and live independently and meet young women from um, sometimes all over the country, sometimes all over the world, um, but certainly from New England. The um, New England farms were particularly targeted by the growing number of textile mills who needed essentially cheap labor to run the machines and who knew that many of the farms struggled um, with large families to feed them, to educate them, to care for them. And this was a way for a young woman to send money home and to buy herself a, a few luxuries um, from time to time. Um, so there was a sense of pride joining the textile mills. And this was probably painted around 1833, shortly after she um, joined the workforce at the, um, at, at the Phoenix factory. And this is a picture of the Phoenix factory, um, which went through many iterations in its life, um, finally ending up as a furniture producing factory. But here it is in its heyday as a textile mill. And this is a picture of what were called um, sometimes tenement houses or the boarding um, rooms in which the young woman would live. And each of these tenement or boarding houses um, would house anywhere between 20 and 40 of these young women who primarily ranged in age between 15 and 30, although children as young as eight or nine were known to have been working in the mills as well. Each of the rooms housed sometimes five young women um, in a small room and to accommodate them, the beds were actually laid out like the wheels of a spoke with the headboards um, pointing into the center. And there was no seating, so um, the young women's trunks um, became seating areas and their band boxes were storage um, under the headboards. But it, aside from the cramped quarters with no windows and low ceilings, there was a library that was accessible to the young women. Um, there was um, 
a main dining room um, where they would all gather and there were some other amenities that were afforded to those who wanted to take advantage of it. But life was tough. I mean, the day started as soon as it was daylight and um, they would have a half hour for a quick breakfast and then it was to work for several hours until they were called um, by bell um, for a half hour of lunch at around 1230. Then the bell ended their lunch half hour. They went back to work at the machines and worked until around 730 at night um, when the bell rang again and they returned to um, their quarters for a, a dinner meal. And then there was two hours of leisure time until curfew. Um, there were overseers in the mills while they worked. There were overseers in the boarding houses um, to make sure that they were well behaved. So it was a very, um, very proscribed life. There are records that show Eliza Gordon. Here's her name entered in this record and we have pages and pages of them. She worked in the preparation room and this says that she was engaged in drawing, which may mean that one of her responsibilities was keeping the threads straight as they fed through the machines. And as one looks at what she was paid and how many days she worked um, and the amount deducted for her room and board, because of course she had to pay for her food and for her bed, um, there wasn't all that much left over at the end of the week. She worked at the mills for a couple of years and like many other women, um, she left um, upon her marriage. And she married Zophar Willard Brooks, who was a farmer, um, but also for a time engaged as a decorative painter. And this is a photograph of his work box with his stencils and some of his brushes. Now, a girl, a young woman such as Eliza Gordon's life wouldn't have left much, much of a public record except for an unusual um, couple, Dr. Samuel Addison Shute and his wife Ruth Whittier Shute, who entered into a unique painting collaboration, working together on each of the portraits that they painted primarily in watercolor on large sheets of paper. Um, which made them of a size to compare to the more expensive oil on canvas, but less expensive because of the materials and the quickness with which a portrait could be painted. Um, one clue to their partnership is contained in these portraits of Joseph Gilman Parker and his wife, Mary Todd Parker. Joseph Gilman Parker is carrying a newspaper dated 1832, and it's a Lowell newspaper that was in print for just a short time. Um, but the shoots were in Lowell because they were painting many of the young women who were working in the Lowell textile mill, um, possibly the most famous of all the textile mills in America in, in, in mid 19th century. And on the back of his portrait is an inscription that says that it was painted, drawn by um, Mrs. Shute and painted by Dr. Shute. So that lets us know that Mrs. Shute did most of the pencil underdrawing and Dr. Shute um, did the watercolor painting primarily. And one of the characteristics of his approach were these um, sweeping diagonal lines in the background. Um, also, um, in terms of the drawing, spaces left, the composition spaces left between the arms and the waists of, of the women. They also employed some unusual techniques. If we um, take a close look at the portrait of Eliza Gordon, you'll see that her bodice um, gives the appearance of transparency because they've actually left the paper unpainted, um, which was very clever. They've also used unusual materials. Her earrings, her brooch, and her ring are all applied metallic paint that has some dimensionality to it. So they were um, 
very given to using unorthodox materials, whatever would heighten the effect. Uh, but they concentrated on the populations of the textile mills while they worked together. One reason that we believe the portrait of Eliza Gordon was painted near the beginning of her tenure at the, at the mill is because Dr. Shute died at a very young age, 27 years, in 1833 and um, toward the end of the year and she came to the mill in June of 1833. So this was probably painted um, at the beginning of her time at the mill because it has all the characteristics of the shoots working together in collaboration. Um, one, one other note, the rose that she holds in her hand, um, years ago, I received a phone call out of the blue from a woman who said that she was a descendant of Eliza Gordon Brooks and she wanted me to know that they actually had in their possession the rose that was used in her portrait um, because it was made of linen and while she wouldn't give it to the museum at the time um, to my disappointment I was very interested to know um, that it was in fact a prop rose that was used in the portrait. Sadly the family lost that rose some years later. As we travel up the stairs into the upper gallery we're entering into the section of travelers and I'll just take you deeper into this gallery and talk about the trousseau robe that we see at the front of that room. This robe was made by a woman named, for, for the sake of simplicity, and you'll understand why in a few moments, I will call Re Emma Rebecca Cummins. And the family calls it a trousseau robe, which it may well have been because she was married four times. So we don't know which marriage this would have been associated with. Um, but she led a very um, interesting and independent and um, unusual life um, traveling from her home of Somerset, Pennsylvania to French, Can French Canada to Utah to Wyoming to Idaho um, and, and other parts of the country. Her father was a Civil War general who died at the Battle of Gettysburg. And it's probably just about that time that Emma Rebecca Cummins married for the first time. She was only 14 years old and she married a French Canadian who brought her home to his family. He treated her so cruelly that his family actually paid to have her return to Somerset, Pennsylvania and the safety of her own family. Um, she, sometime after that, she married a Dr. George Snively in Pennsylvania. He went out west to Utah uh, along with so many other um, men seeking their fortunes in um, the mines and other opportunities presented by the growing um, western part of the country. She stayed behind with a young daughter and um, became one of what has been called waiting women um, who were basically left to their own devices while their husbands or um, loved ones, male loved ones went out west seeking their fortunes. And so she did the best that she could during the 10 years or so that she was on her own until her husband sent for her around 1870. She traveled to Utah to join him and by December 1872, she actually became a telegrapher on the railroad. Um, this was becoming a very important um, role for people to, to um, play with the expanding railroad system to ensure the safety of the trains as they traveled on the tracks. And she would have needed to learn Samuel B um, Morse's telegraph um, system. And 
people were especially sought out for their handwriting, for their ability to take quick notes, and for their ability to condense messages into nine or ten words, which is what a telegraph could accommodate. And here we see a sample of Emma now Cummins Snively's handwriting. And I'm just going to read this to you. This is, this is a few years later in 1886, um, but this is just you know, the kind of funny incident that could happen um, when the telegraphers were in these very remote outposts, not expecting to see another, another soul, except perhaps whoever else was at the station with them, except when a train came by. And she wrote, um, about 4.30 this p.m., Minnie, Alice, and I lay down to have a nap. It was quite warm, so I took off nearly all my clothing and opened doors and windows to get all the air possible. Um, thought would only sleep half an hour, but we all slept until um, either that 6.01 or 4.01 uh, was, um, was night at the station. All woke up very much startled, and passengers aboard the train um, were given a free slideshow. So she had quite an embarrassing moment there that she seemed to take in stride. Um, her husband was an alcoholic, was um, not quite as abusive apparently as her first husband, but was certainly no angel. And um, one night in one of the local bars in um, this Western outpost, he became uh, verbally abusive to his wife, who was very well liked. She was very vivacious and very outgoing. And he started saying um, very um, uncomplimentary things about her. And he got into a brawl with a man named Nicholas Lawless, um, who defended Emma's honor and it the um it, the the encounter escalated and guns were drawn and lawless shot snively dead um which didn't stop him from later marrying emma's sister he was um freed from any accusation um because uh, there were many witnesses to the confrontation and emma was now um divorced and widowed she went on to marry a third time to a man named Crozier, divorced him as well, um, went back to Pennsylvania, then returned to Utah, became a cashier uh, in Salt Lake City. She became a postmaster um, in um, Collinston and Elder County in Utah, and then finally returned to Pennsylvania. Um, where she married for her final and last time um, a man named Pauling who had also fought in the Civil War and thus the story of the adventures of Emma Cummins, Blakelock, Snively, Crozier, Pauling. Emma's trousseau robe was pieced in an irregular fashion, kind of as irregular as her life, that we know today as um, crazy quilting. And this is a beautiful quilt um, in this crazy quilt idiom by an immig a German immigrant woman named Clara Dobriner Leon. Clara was born in Germany. Um, she came to the United States in 1867. She arrived in the port of New York on the ship America. She married another German immigrant um, the following year in Manhattan. And following the migration pattern of so many um, immigrant German Jews, the Leons joined a growing Jewish pioneer community on the Western frontier. They traveled by covered wagon from New York City to Independence, Missouri, and that's where their daughter, Carrie, was born. But by 1873, they were in Las Vegas, New Mexico, um, which was the largest town between um, Independence and San Francisco, and it was very favorably positioned um, uh, along the Santa Fe Trail and was a stop on the expanding um, 
um, developing railway system. Her husband was a merchant and he set up shop in Las Vegas. They were among 36 Jewish families who were living in Las Vegas at the time, and they established the first congregation in the New Mexico territories. Now, Las Vegas was kind of a terrible um, place, a uh, dangerous place. It's where Doc Holliday hung out um, his shingle for the final time. It saw the passage of outlaws like Billy the Kid and Jesse James pass through. Um, Clara Leon related um, to her family that it was a very common sight to see horse thieves strung up in the plaza. Um, but Clara herself came from a very cultured and musical family. And it's, it's told in the family that uh, along with um, Clara, her husband, um, and her daughter migrating in covered wagon to the um, pioneer communities. She also had her piano travel by covered wagon to Las Vegas. I wanted to show you a close up of this block of her quilt because you can see the musical staff um, at the top that speaks to her musical background and also this little motif of three linked circles, which is a symbol of the Odd Fellows. Um, by 1892, Clara and her husband moved to Trinidad, Colorado, and they were members of the Temple Aaron, the oldest synagogue in Colorado. She was a charter member of the Hebrew Ladies Aid Society. She participated in fundraising fairs and teas, and she, was, she and her husband were buried in the Masonic and Odd Fellows Cemetery in Trinidad. Um, but let's talk about the crazy quilt for just a moment, because here's a woman who came to the United States, probably without a quilt making tradition at all, learned um, to make quilts in America and moved to the you know, for the most Western frontiers, yet was able to participate in um, a current trend of the crazy quilt, which was introduced in probably around 1876. Um, one of the major um, contributors to the crazy quilt aesthetic seems to have been the Japanese pavilion at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition. And these are just two um, photographs of that pavilion that show some of the motifs that visitors were introduced to for the first time. It is um, thought that another influence was Japanese porcelain with its cracked um, surface, uh, which had a crazed, irregular um, fashion. So this became part of the newest trend in um, quilt making, along with a rejection of the earlier cotton fabrics that were used with quilts, and instead a reliance on sumptuous luxury fabrics that were by this time beginning to be domestically produced and also less expensive um, it, access to less expensive imported silks and velvets and, and, and other luxury fabrics. Also, because her husband was a merchant and there also was a fledgling department store in Las Vegas, she might have had access to these luxurious fabrics when she made her quilt. And in her quilt, she put a different floral border on each of the four sides, which I just wanted to point out uh, because I think it's a lovely device. She seems to have used each of the borders to um, refer to one of the four seasons. Um, clearly the fall is at the top and I will surmise that a winter is below it, spring below that and summer at the bottom and she was clearly a very skilled needleworker. Um, this is an environment that was in the Mojave Desert in Yermo, California on Calico Ghost Town Road um, that was known popularly as Possum Trot. And um, the Possum Trot environment was the work of two people, Cal Black and Ruby Black. And the Blacks were rural Southerners. They, Cal was born in Tennessee, 
Ruby was born in Georgia. Cal had, they, they met when Cal was passing through Georgia with a traveling um, circus. They fell in love and they married in 1933. Um, they shortly thereafter moved to California where Cal engaged in a variety of jobs, but um, primarily panning um, for gold. And the many, many years of standing in the frigid waters um, took its toll on his health and he developed diabetes and his circulation was very poor. And um, they had always had something of a subsistence living, um, but they needed to do something for his health. And they saw an ad in a magazine for a property in the desert in um, Yermo, California. And they thought that this would be an improvement for him. So they purchased a tract of land sight unseen and found themselves in this featureless expanse of desert in the middle of nowhere uh, along um, the expanding Highway 51. And uh, when that highway was invigorated um, at some point in the 1950s, they um, opened a rock and tourist shop. Um, but over the years that they lived in the desert, um, Cal started to develop this um, compound essentially where they had quarries in the back in the middle where they had different rocks um, that visitors could come and um, and purchase and they sold cold soda and souvenirs out of a little um, storefront in their shack um, everything they had to build and innovate themselves. They had no electricity, they had no running water, they had no telephones. Um, so they were largely dependent upon the traffic that passed by. Um, so around 1953, Cal started carving figures um, out of redwood telephone poles, um, according to somebody who um, spoke with um, with Ruby later in her life, he would wait until a motorist knocked into a pole, knocked a pole down, and then he'd go and he'd um, grab the pole and use it to carve uh, primarily the faces of his figures. And the bodies um, and the noses were made out of sugar pine, which was easy, um, easier to work with. And he created around 80 or so of these figures. The ones that were stationed outdoors um, had arms and legs that were um, bolted so that they, or hinged so that they would move in the wind. Um, and I'm just gonna go back for a second. And you, you can see that he had some of them stationed up high, some of them stationed low. Um, some of them rode bicycles. This one is on a bicycle. They engaged in different activities. Some of them were uh, attached to poles and were very high. And their movement would attract people to stop while they were driving by and hopefully buy something. At some point, when he had enough figures, he opened the Birdcage Theater. And performing in the Birdcage Theater was the fantasy doll show. Um, he called his girls the, um, the, the, the desert doll um, show. And he, as a young man, had um, experienced carving dolls from corn cob pipes. So it wasn't unusual, unusual for him to create figures. And he also had his vaudeville experience um, as a teenager, he had entered a contest to sing in a falsetto voice, which he won. So he was, he was um, ingenious and innovative, but he was also a performer. And so he created these figures and Ruby would dress them from clothing that she salvaged from the nearest dump usually, and that she cut down and refashioned for the dolls. Um, but the dolls, there's, there's a largely autobiographical component to them. They mostly feature people that Cal knew throughout his life and that the Blacks knew together. Sadly, they did not have any children of their own. Um, Ruby um, told an interviewer that she had 
miscarried early in their marriage and that she was not able to have children after that. So these dolls did in fact become their family and um, they were animated and motivated. Um, and this is the back of one of the figures that has a speaker attached to it so that when um, Cal, Cal was um, recording his little skits, that is how the figures would speak. Okay, moving forward um, into philosophers. And, and Stacy, you know, I think at this point we've, um, there's so much to talk oh, about in this okay. wonderful oh, exhibition, right. but we are, um, we have just 10 minutes of the program left. So I think okay. um, we'd love to invite um, some questions from our audience and, and to thank you for this incredibly insightful um, <laughs> presentation. It's such a rich exhibition um, and there are so many stories to tell. You see, in person, I can just keep going and walking. It's a, it's a very different experience here. I'm just going to go through some of the images then to let people see a little bit more of the show. That, of course, was Marino Oridi's Encyclopedic Palace. And this is his statement of purpose for the patent that he filed to build it. Um, and just continuing to walk around the upper galleries and um, show you um, Jean-Michel Saint-Jacques' beautiful wooden quilt made out of remnants of his Katrina destroyed home. Um, he incorporates a self-portrait into, um, into the quilts and showing himself um, in his participation um, in the blast, black masking ceremonies um, in New Orleans. And these are his costumes that he makes himself um, as a medicine man, and then going into the last gallery um, that deals with the idea of seeking um, religious freedom, seeking um, self-awareness, um, seeking acceptance, um, whether it's religious or personal.